Major apologies, everyone. We were trying to fix Max Layton's tech issues. Uh, can everyone hear me is the first question. Uh, thank you. Uh, I am going to be sharing my screen. Uh, I'm Gavin Barrett, by the way, for those who don't know me. I am the co-curator, uh, well, now the curator of the Tartan Term and Secret Readings uh, and the co-curator of tonight's evening, uh, well, I'm the host of tonight's evening with, with George Elliot Clark being the curator. Uh, I had a co-curator who we lost very sadly, and I'll speak about that um, in, a, in a second or two. First, let me share my screen and welcome you all to the Tartan Turban Secret Readings. Uh, can you see me full? Can you see my screen full screen just now? Just want a thumbs up is good. Excellent. Thank you. So uh, we have a pretty full evening tonight. Uh, it's, a, it's a feast that George has prepared for us. I apologize for the delay. Uh, at all, as always, we must acknowledge with a land, begin with the land acknowledgement. Uh, my name, as I mentioned earlier, is Gavin Barrett. I myself am a poet. I am an immigrant as well, and so a settler. Uh, for me, in my own experience, I come from India, which is, as I describe it, the world's largest experiment in successful decolonization. Uh, and I come in peace as an immigrant uh, and as a settler uh, with love and for justice. And I praise those who came on to this land before me, long before me, millennia ago, and who walked this land and cared for it and now created a sense of welcome for, for me on it. The Anishinaabeg, the Mississauga, Mississaugas, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat. The land has seen human activity for 15,000 years. It's dish with one spoon treaty territory. Uh, newcomers have been welcomed here in peace and friendship and respect throughout. Uh, and our role is to participate in, in the perpetuation of that peace, friendship and respect. These are Treaty 13 and Williams ter uh, Treaties lands. Uh, traditional territory of the Mississaugas, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat. I also like at this point to recognize a history of broken and bad faith treaties that have existed uh, on this land, and that there is an urgent need for reconciliation here. Uh, we're grateful to be able to host the Tartan Turban Secret Readings and this special event uh, with George Elliott Clark uh, on this land. And uh, I encourage you to acknowledge where you are in the chat, uh, you know, if you're not sure, you can look up whose land, whose dot land slash E N um, and just post in the chat. But, uh, you know, if you don't, that's fine. Look it up later. Uh, a couple of housekeeping announcements. If you need to leave early, you can just drop off the call. We, you don't need to have to type a message or anything. Just let us, you know, just you can quietly drop off the beauty of being on a Zoom call. We ask that you keep your microphone muted throughout. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can turn your camera on whenever, you know, you want to give everyone a round of applause because they need to see your faces and it's really lovely to be able to see you uh, when that's happening. Uh, but you can keep your camera off while the reading is going on and when Didi is playing uh, his co compositions. Uh, we just want to make sure that all the bandwidth has been devoted to those who are uh, performing today. Um, Unfortunately, there are some technical difficulties as we have just discovered that we cannot overcome because of the remote nature of our technology. Uh, this doesn't always happen, uh, but you know sometimes it does. One of the advantages we have is that you can actually uh, request closed captioning. It's, uh, there's three dots at the bottom right of your screen where you can re request a live transcript and it's enabled. So if you request it, uh, you know, I'll simply grant it if anyone wants the advantage of closed captioning accompanying this reading. Um, this incredible talent is being made available at no charge, as you know. Uh, we are lucky to have the support of the League of Canadian Poets and the Canada Council for the Arts, and we thank them for their support uh, for this reading. Uh, but there's also the support of the artists who are present tonight. And in exchange, I always encourage everyone who is attending to support, to in, you know, to return that 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 generous donation of talent and time by supporting these writers and and our musician, uh, D.D. Jackson, buying their works, uh, following them on social media, 
uh, you know, liking every goddamn thing they say, uh, <laughs> you know, in every venue you have access to <laughs> to see it or hear it. Um, f rate their books on Goodreads, give them five star ratings, even if you haven't read them. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, be shameless about supporting them. Uh, for us, uh, I run a small ad agency which focuses on inclusion through communication. Hear anybody. Us too. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh. It helps. Uh, it helps us when you like us on Facebook or or Google as well. So Barrett and Welsh, just you know, give us a few stars. Thank you. It's not easy to survive as a small business, and every yes. positive review helps. Uh, people ask, why is this called the Tartan Turban? George is going to talk about five poets, you know, breaking into song. We'll, we'll, we'll. I'm going to let him speak to all of that. Uh, well, it's called the Tartan Turban because that's the logo of this company, uh, and we want to support the community, the creative community that we belong to here in Toronto, uh, and to shine a light on the incredible diversity of talent that we have in this country. Now. Uh, the readings were launched by Mayank and I, Mayank Butt and I, in 2017 to celebrate uh, writers and to center writers who are identified as Black, Indigenous, or as people of color, who don't always experience privilege in Canada. And to, you know, so we have George, we have Dee Dee here today. Um, uh, I will turn that on in a second, Dee Dee, as soon as I stop sharing. Um, and so I just want to say thank you to George at this point and. I want to just stop for a moment and uh, mention my dear friend, Mayank, who was uh, my co-founder until he passed away on August 1st. Uh, we, Mayank was a va very valued member of our com literary community. Uh, he attended in any number of events. He's probably attended every one of your events, uh, if you read, in, in Toronto. Uh, and he gave his support and his generosity and his insight to every writer who asked. Uh, and all his fellow writers who ever got to meet him remember him with tremendous gratitude and respect. He wrote a, a blog called Generally About Books, uh, where he reviewed uh, and showcased writers and their work. And when he and I launched the uh, Tartan Turban Secret Readings in 2017, uh, you know, we, we didn't expect it to develop into this incredibly vibrant and well-attended event that it has become uh, in Toronto's writing community. Uh, Mayank has done many more things besides that. And in his memory, uh, his his family, uh, uh, M.G. Vasanji, myself, Don Promislaw, have banded together to create a scholarship in his name. It's going to be called the Mayank and Maruk Bhatt uh, Scholarship for uh, Students of Merit who are in need. Uh, it's at Humber, at Humber College uh, uh, School for Writers because that's where Mayank went and he benefited from that program and loved it. And now I'm going to introduce you to our curator for the evening, uh, a man I describe as uh, an absolute whirling dervish of poetry and literary accomplishment, uh, George Eliot Clark. Uh, some 60 plus books under his belt, uh, you know, and some incredible amount of award winning poetry. George was the fourth poet laureate of Toronto between 2012 and 2015. He was the uh, seventh parliamentary Canadian poet laureate between 2016 and, and 17. He was born in Windsor, Nova Scotia. Uh, he's a professor of English at uh, the University of Toronto. He taught at Duke, at McGill, at UBC, at Harvard. And he's had uh, accomplishments uh, that cannot be contained on a page. So we've culled a very small list here so that we can, you know, uh, we can fit the screen. Uh, you know, you've got the Rockefeller Foundation Fellowship, the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Fellowship, uh, Fellows Prize, of course, the Governor General's Award for Poetry, uh, the National Magazine Gold Award for Poetry, uh, awards from uh, Romania, uh, you know, and, and, and more, and more, and more. Uh, his poetry has been translated into Chinese, into Italian, into Romanian, uh, and he has dreamt up five poets breaking into song to bring poets and composers together. And at the end of the evening, you'll hear Dee Dee Jackson play the song he has written for George's 261 Fuller Terrace at the very end of the evening. But now I'm going to turn the entire evening uh, over to George to run the show till the very end. Oh, George. no! No, Gavin, you cannot do that. That's that's uh, that's that's living dangerously. Please don't do that. 
Um, but let me say, let me uh, begin by saying how honored, privileged, happy I am, Gavin, to be sharing this evening with you, and of course with uh, Tartan uh, Turban uh, Secret Reading Series number thirty-six, uh, along with the five poets, which is only the sixth edition compared to thirty-six iterations of the Tartan Turban uh, Secret Reading Series. I join with you in in honoring uh, the memory of your uh, great colleague uh, who assisted you so powerfully in putting together that, that uh, reading series. And I am sorry for, for uh, his departure, although his spirit very much remains, I know, with us and, and is uh, very present with us uh, this evening. Uh, I also want to take this opportunity to mention that uh, we also, uh, along with Mr. Bat, uh, lost uh, recently Luciano Iacobelli, a poet here from uh, in Toronto, passed away uh, early uh, uh, this month, and whose memorial is in fact taking place this evening in downtown Toronto uh, at a venue that, that uh, he would very much have appreciated uh, himself. Uh, so we are honoring the legacies of these two very fine writers while also celebrating the legacies of writers, poets like Irving Layton and Libby Shire. And, and again, I'm very sorry that they are not with us uh, today, this evening, but of course their works live on and all of their works live on and we are here to celebrate and honor their contributions as poets to the culture of Canada, and for that matter, to the humanities around the world, to literature and English. And along with honoring uh, Irving Layton and Libby Shire, we are also so privileged to be able to think about and enjoy the works of Micheline Mailer and uh, Bruce Meyer and Al Moritz, and and uh, and I just wanted I'll stop because I know I'm talk, probably talking too much uh, for now at least uh, to saying uh, once again um, how much of a privilege it is to be able to work with such a uh, great uh, composer and I'm going to put that capital G R E A T it's all caps all the way along D D Jackson uh, who is based in Manhattan. Uh, a known entity, quantity, person of superb quality, in terms of his in terms of his of his humanitarianism. I'm going to use the G word, the other G word besides great. I'm going to use the word genius. Uh, and I know he's probably blushing invisibly behind the screen, but that's okay. He can blush away. He can blush all he wants because I think the evidence is there in the work itself. And I'm so happy that Gavin has uh, brought us together, uh, the Tartan. Uh, Turban Secret Reading Series uh, to celebrate uh, the poets I just mentioned, but also to hear, to hear what Dee Dee Jackson, native of Ottawa, now taking Manhattan by storm, has contributed uh, to these fine works of words. And, and again, it's been just such an honor and privilege to work with him in helping to produce new Canadian art song with a jazz uh, direction or twist if one prefers. So here's his bio. I'm not going to read the entire bio because it's much longer than what we have on screen that you can see for yourselves and read for yourself. But look it. I'm going to speak like a Nova Scotian. Look it. He's Canadian born. Two time Emmy winning composer, songwriter, producer, five times nominated, and a jazz penis composer who has recorded 13. CDs of mostly original music as leader or co-leader, including two for the major label BMG, ranging from his Juno award-winning solo piano CD so far to his larger scale meditation on the events of 9-11 suite for New York. He has also performed, recorded, and or toured around the world with diverse artists, ranging from saxophonist David Murray and James Carter, violinist Billy Bang and drummer Jack DeJohnett to Quest Love and Tariq Trotter, Black Thought, in other words, of the roots, and previously composed two jazz-influenced operas with uh, myself. And, I'll, and of course, I'll just give you the titles very quickly. Trudeau, Long March, uh, Shining Path, about the first Trudeau Prime Minister, and Te Besite, based in part 
on the story of Dee Dee's African-American father and Chinese mother. He's composed for TV. He has written songs and other music for a wide range of shows. Keep in mind, five Emmy nominations, five Emmy nominations. Uh, and so therefore, uh, I think that just that fact alone tells you that this is an extremely accomplished, versatile, world class. We are so lucky. I mean it. We are so lucky to have Dee Dee Jackson on our computer screens over Zoom from New York City. Dee Dee Jackson. I have, now I have to respond just for a second and say thank you, George, and I need to take you on the road with me to constantly uh, <laughs> introduce me like that and, and talk to my family about that a little bit more. So, you know, they'll, they'll prop me up a little bit more after hearing your wonderful uh, praise. But no, you, it was very kind of you to say all of that. I'm so happy to be here. I want to thank you, uh, George, for your uh, I, concept for this entire thing. This is our second such concert. And, um, you know, the first one was so much, so enjoyable. And of course, now there's this new Canada Council grant that I just got. I have to thank you also for that by coming up with this concept for this, this whole project. So I'm very privileged and, and pleased to be able to now have the opportunity to go into the studio and, and record not just what you're going to hear tonight, which are more demo oriented versions of these pieces, but really do the full fledged uh, production on these pieces. So, uh, so uh, I'm very happy also, thank you to Gavin, very happy to be here and happy to meet pseudo face to face all of these poets for the first time that is all i wanted to say back to you all but thank you so much so uh is it time now for gavin to do some more intro or magic uh, it's or is be, it time it, for it's, al it's to time be introduced? For al. it's time for al to be introduced okay uh uh, uh, do you have the introduction? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Coming up. Coming up. All right. Thank you. All right. So I'll I'll just read it off the screen. Everybody can read along with me. Uh, but holy smokes! I mean, <laughs> Al Moritz. I, I got. I just got to tell you that I was an undergraduate at the University of Waterloo, back, way back 1983, working on my first book of poetry, and I came to Toronto, and I was wandering around a small press book fair. And it was a Saturday in April 1983. And I came across Al Moritz's book of poems, Black Orchid. And I was hooked right away. I love the whole idea, the surrealism of the artwork that he used to illustrate that book. Uh, but I shouldn't be telling you just my personal uh, first encounter through literature with A.F. Moritz, but to give you his stellar background. So here it is. His most recent book of poems are The Garden, a poem and an essay. You gotta read it because it's actually a meditation on how race has impacted uh, especially America, uh, and but also of course uh, uh, Canada. But it's a meditation on the LA riots of 92, followed with meditation on, on George Floyd's uh, execution uh, in Minneapolis. As far as you know, Anansi 2020, The Sparrow Selected Poems, a Nancy 2018, as well as a new edition of poems in Greek translation. And, and of course, that's from the, sucked it from the Sparrow. He has published 20 volumes of poetry and his work has received the Guggenheim Fellowship, the Griffin Poetry Prize, the Award in Literature of the American Academy of Arts and Letters, the Best Puckin Award of Poetry Magazine, and three times been selected as a finalist for the Governor General's Award, amongst other owners. Now look it, I'm still speaking like a Nova Scotian. He is presently the sixth Poet Laureate of Toronto, uh, and and uh, has done just tremendous work for all poets everywhere all the time. He liked to leave us this evening prematurely, but very importantly to attend the memorial for Luciano Iacobelli, who I mentioned at the beginning of our of our uh, conversation this evening. So without any further ado, Al Moritz. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi, so many friends and also uh, uh, beautiful people unknown to me. So let me say, I'm going to read one whole section of the poem. Uh, the, uh, this book, The Garden, is a long poem and a long essay, and the essay is really just part of the poem. But the poem, the verse part, um, 
it does divide down into several sections. And one is about the great blues man, Skip James, or based on the great blues man, Skip James. And so I'm going to read that section. That's the section from which George and Dee Dee took the lyrics to Dee Dee's song. And um, Dee Dee's song really uses, with some editing or some changing around, the first uh, two, two pages and a bit, two pages and a half of this uh, section called The Blues. So I'm going to read the whole section, so I'll, I'll go well past this uh, part that is the song. So just let me say to you, when you hear me come to the lines, if just once more ever I get up off of this killing floor, never again will I lie down, fall down, be pushed down here, or shot down, come back down, never anymore. You'll hear those lines as the end of Dee Dee's lyrics. And those lines are paraphrased from a famous song by Skip James, right? So I, I, I called, uh, you know, Hard Time Killing Floor Blues. So that song was recorded in 1931. So I'll just say a few things here. Skip James was a great blues man, uh, lived 1902 to 1969. Uh, he recorded in 1931, but his career was almost immediately, as a recording artist, was almost immediately finished by the fact that people quit buying records because of the depression, which he sang about. So uh, for all we know, he didn't do any more singing or who knows what performing even for 30 years. In 1964, he was rediscovered as part of the folk revival. Well, really, a lot of people say that the almost simultaneous rediscovery of him and Sun House as still living and singing was the real spur of the folk revival. Skip James's first name was Nehemiah. And so you will find in my poem a lot of reference to the uh, biblical book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was of the priestly class and he was a, a main um, driver in the reconstruction of the temple after the um, uh, repatriation of many of the Jews uh, from, from Babylon to, uh, to Jerusalem and surroundings to Judea. So um, you'll see some references to the ancient um, uh, cityscape of, of Jerusalem, like uh, you'll hear the, um, the gold gate the gold, and the gold tower, the towers on the walls and the gates on the wall. I, I don't know that there's anything else maybe you need to know. I could maybe mention that at the end I use, um, there's a lot of quotations in here from William Blake, from Whitman, but mainly from the blues and from its successors like uh, uh, rhythm and blues and doo-wop. And um, at the end, there's I use a lot of um, song of a, of a song called uh, uh, um, "Guess Who" by Jesse Belvin, which BB King always used in a very cut down form, almost as a sound logo in his concerts. He would always play a little bit of Guess Who as a kind of almost a sign off piece, right? And that's if you don't know that song, or you don't know Jesse Belvin, look him up. Coda, the blues. The depression deepened 1931 and tanked the singing career of Skip James, hard times everywhere you go, everywhere people drifting door to door, dragging slow, nowhere a heaven haven, and who cares where they go? The power, the drive, the engine of that ancient lonesome song, where did it come from? To light on those nine fiery discs, 18 songs set down in Grafton, Wisconsin, for the self-named Paramount Company. And Skip did make with those discs a celestial mode. And you know, although you're turning your back, you know where the power came from and where alone it comes from, from what little tent, by what great river, what onyx depth of indomitable life, whose other lesser name you hear sometimes in your service, hope. You know what it sings. If just once more, 
ever I get up off of this killing floor, never again will I lie down, fall down, be pushed down here or shot down, come back down, never anymore. And Skip was silent then for 30 years. Nehemiah, James, waiting to come back, jump back, skip the light, ecstatic, the troubled man, difficult often to talk to, and build the walls again in the growl and howl of his song with their gates of plenty, fish gate, sheep gate for all people, and magnificence, their golden tower and their blast furnace tower, to work again, to have work, to walk at 7 a.m., the dew on the little lawns of the houses and concrete curbed gardens of the projects, thorn hedges with their waxen orange and scarlet berries, to walk swinging your dented, scratched blue lunch bucket into U.S. steel over the Division Street Bridge, or to trudge the oak and elm-guarded side street, the trickle of your neighbors tiding into another stream of workers at every corner, and finally, the spate on Main Street, where it flows north, and there you go by the first and last chance tavern. Beyond it, you all pass in to the Republic Works, its four stacks sending their blue-gray drifts out over poisoned scrub fields of Joe Pye weed in blue-gray flower behind gray paintless houses. Even that work, to have it and so dream of other work, so not to be lying in the streets in the idleness of nothing anywhere near around, but shouts and shots, thinking nothing, bitterness. Except the voice even there, comes changing all to a bitter beauty, raising seeming corpses into determination, into laughter. Oh, Sam Hughes, with my father swinging the heavy sledges in rhythm in my five-year-old eyes, breaking up the dense concrete a dense builder of houses had put there, there in the dooryard where the lilac grew, breaking the concrete, stubborn work, Lavorare stanca, and joyful, the barrier slowly rendered to pieces, and there was room for a flower bed now, a window, and a door opening direct to my childhood, tree of the violet essence of spring. So, 33 years later, Skip came back, found again, that was 1964, to build the gates and walls anew. The attitude of him cheered up slaves, his voice building the city, the visible city still very poor, but he builds the great city in song, the women and men, the crowds of them, their cry, equality, diversity that the soul loves. Each one the soul love, his or her precious open gate of a person who never has stood in the presence of superiors, for there are none, building the great city with hands, but first in the raging, sorrowing voice that ever comes back. So tired, it cries, tired of waiting for you, wanting alone to love you, so tired of groaning for you, and so glad, so glad, it cries, yearning for you, for you to love me, Come here, so glad that I don't know what to do. Women and men alive in the voice forever, just let it be. Let it get along. Can't we all just get along? Let it sing. No matter what you do, it will, will sing. I will love you. Oh, promise me, be just, be justice, just Promise me your love in return. Let this fire in me not be smothered and scorned. It cannot die, but you can spill it into the drains. But why? And Skip James did. The great king sang the same, the final king for then, until the new ones, the old and young throats of the dawn song come round again. Look, the sunrise. There God lives and gives his light and heat away to birds, beasts, flowers, and trees. And there I take my lesson and say, 
there is someone who loves you, really loves you, has a life for you that is life, not a fabricated fever of motion by imitation. There is someone true, though you won't believe, who loves you. Guess who? You are turning your back now, but you know who. Okay, that's me. <laughs> oh. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> uh, wow. <laughs> I don't mind saying, wow. Uh, we got to hear, we got to hear Dee Dee's performance, but I'm just going to say quick, real quick, Al, that was a great reading. And what I heard, what I really understood about your work for the first time is how much you are an, an heir to William Carlos Williams and Carl <laughs> Sandburg. Before that, I mean, these were the two poets, uh, American poets, like yourself, American born, that I could hear resonating in the background of that incredible discourse on, on the Rust Belt and, and the making of music in the midst of depression and the racism uh, and marginalization of working class people anyway. Uh, yeah, I, I, I have no hesitation in, in voicing it in, in that way. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, George. Those are true notes for me, yeah. So we're so, going to hear Dee Dee now. I'm getting worried about missing my uh, my Luciano. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Let me know. play. Let me play it. But yeah, if you need to go on that, understandable. I, I have a link uh, that you know we'll be able to share later as well, of course. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to. I'm just going to share the song, right? Yes, everybody. Here we go. Yep. Oh. The Depression deepened 1931 and tanked the singing career of Skip James. Hard times everywhere you go, everywhere people drifting door to door, dragging slow. Nowhere a heaven haven, and who cares where they go? Depression deepened, 1931, and tanked the singing career of Skip James. Hard times, everywhere you go, everywhere people drifting door to door, dragging slow. Nowhere a heaven haven, and who cares where they go? The power to drive the engine of that ancient lonesome song. Where did it come from to light on those fiery discs? 18 songs set down in Grafton, Wisconsin. The engine of that ancient lonesome song Where did it come from To light on those fiery discs Eighteen songs set down in Grafton, Wisconsin And Skip did make with those discs A celestial mold and you know, though you're turning your back, you know where the power came from and where alone it comes from. From what little tent, by what great river, what onyx depth 
of indomitable life Whose other lesser name you hear sometimes In your servant's hope You know what it seems if just once more ever I get up Off on this killing floor Never again will I lie down Fall down Be pushed down here or shot down Come back down Never anymore Anymore Never anymore Never anymore Yay! <laughs> I'm realizing I should mute myself. I hope that didn't cause too much weird feedback. Oh, um, man. So good, so good, so good. Um... Uh, look, um, I just got to ask, uh, Gavin, you, please feel free to ask a question, but I'm going to throw out the first question, and it's for Al, and it's for Dee Dee. What was it like, Dee Dee, working with those words, and Al, what was it like to hear this result? Let, yeah. me, let me answer first, because I got to get going, <laughs> alas, but... Um, it was tr tremendous. Uh, I love the blues, and it's, uh, you know, here's my own words made into a real blues, and yet one that goes with the narrative and dramatic content of the song, too, which is somewhat different and more elaborate and so forth. And um, so I, I think, too, it's just, uh, to me, the song is like an apotheosis, almost, of popular music. You know, like, I love the opera, but basically it usually sinks the words. Uh, the popular music at the best supports them and honors them, and I just felt supported and honored all over the block by this thing, you know, as if it just uh, it, it just brought out the meaning and then praised and elevated it, you know. Uh, um, so that would be my feeling. I'm wow. I'm uh, astonished. It's just lovely. Oh, like, well, that's... it's a stupid word, I suppose. But uh, no, no, it's lovely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you you can well, use thanks. that word. I mean, yeah. Well, thank you, Dee Dee, and we'll get together more on it in the future. I'm I'm sorry I have to run, or must bounce, as I say, must bounce, because I'm yeah. a collector of antiquated slang, so I have Amen. to use it sometimes. <laughs> well, thank you so much for the opportunity of collaborating <laughs> with you, Al. Uh, you know, beautiful... Uh, poem. I mean, it was it was at first a challenge just because it's such an epic quality poem going through so many different moods and so many different uh, expressions uh, and reflections on this person's life. But uh, you know, you touched upon it for me on a musical level that the blues was obviously the title was in you know blues was in the title to begin with, but also in researching Skip James on uh, myself in preparation, just getting that whole feel uh, into my bones. It really made yeah, it yeah. That's another thing. Like, like you did it. You're, uh, you're a more what, what we should say, mellifluous or semi bel canto singer. But you really got the uh, almost like a poetic illusion. You allude to James with your voice and your delivery in a lot of the places there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If anybody doesn't know Skip James, there's a valuable study for Look you. That's just a wonderful. You'll have a wonderful time finding out about Skip James and listening to some of his music. Yeah, that was a bonus pleasure for me to just have the opportunity to really dive into. Yeah. That. I, I love to yeah. just complete it. Really okay, good. everybody. Good night. Sorry Thank to you. not <laughs> be able to stay for the whole yeah. thing. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Al. And, and I will say that wait, I, you know, wait, I, I don't really consider of the myself a singer. So I, you know, I, I'm used to doing demos and just kind of optimizing things for the clients, whoever I'm writing stuff for, and making it yeah. as, as best as I can. But um, if there's a, if Dean Bowman is out there. This song has your name on it, basically. He's, <laughs> I think he's living in Romania now, but he was in the jazz opera that George and I wrote, Cabecite, and just incredible uh, blues-oriented singer. And um, Well, I hope he, he is out yeah, there, I'll, but I like I'll, your I'll, version. I'll be talking to him, but I appreciate that. Uh, if your me. version is only the demo for the hit record, I will it, still treasure it. Is, it, it is indeed a demo, but uh, <laughs> Dean, if you're out there, I'm, I'm coming after you. Oh, okay. Thank anyway. you so much, Al. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Al.
George, back to you. Okay. Uh, well, uh, look, I am almost speechless, believe it or not. Um, that was such an intense uh, performance, rendition, uh, and an exposition of, of the inspiration for the blues, which, of course, as we know from history, has to do with a response to socioeconomic injustice. And that impacts everybody, and as it is right now, with runaway inflation and all that, but I won't stop preaching. I'll just say that, that uh, Dee Dee, your treatment of Al's exploration of that desperate period of the 1930s, desperate racially, desperate um, economically, uh, was uh, absolutely spellbinding uh, and, and inimitable. Uh, and I think you really brought out all those uh, textures and nuances in Al's poem. So, uh, and you know, in only a few minutes, that was that was great. Um, so, but now we have to move on to uh, uh, our next poet, who in some ways doesn't need any uh, introduction, especially for Canadians. But I can also add for Italians. Uh, for uh, readers of Greek poetry, and that's because Irving Layton, born uh, uh, 1912 uh, in the Romanian town of Targu uh, Nayimt, uh, 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 and of course uh, his family moved to Montreal where he grew up, um, uh, was also translated into uh, in books. I mean, books, not just a, a poem here and a poem there, but he got translated into a whole books of Italian poetry and Greek poetry. Uh, and so he was nominated for the Nobel Prize by uh, uh, Italy and Japan. Uh, so he was definitely an internationally acclaimed, renowned, celebrated uh, poet, really the first from Canada to achieve that kind of international uh, acclaim. But to stick to the uh, bio we have in front of us, his family moved to Montreal when he was a year old. Uh, when his father passed away, Leighton, just 13, enrolled in high school, where his encounter with Tennyson's poem, The Revenge, inspired him to try writing. And I'm going to guess, knowing Irving Leighton through his work mainly, and, or I should say only through his work, I would bet that his own work was a kind of revenge, uh, to a certain extent, on Tennyson, who deserved to have some revenge. After earning a degree in agriculture at McDonald College, becoming a socialist, I know, Pierre Polyev, I know that you cannot sleep tonight because you just heard somebody describe Irving Layton as having been a socialist. Pierre Polyev, we're out there. We are, we're out there. We socialists, we're out there. You can't sleep anymore. Don't worry. We're not going to let you sleep. But anyway, uh, he did enroll briefly in the Canadian Army during World War II. Layton published his first book in 1945 and soon counted poet and singer Leonard Cohen as his student and close friend, and U.S. poet William Carlos Williams, who I just mentioned in reference to uh, uh, the poetry that Al Moritz uh, just, just read for us. But uh, William Carlos Williams introduced uh, Layton's first celebrated volume, A Red Carpet for the Sun, which received the Governor General's Award. And you should know that William Carlos Williams also introduced Allen Ginsberg's uh, fantastic collection of poetry, Hal and other poems. So there's a really nice connection uh, here between these poets, Al Moritz, Irving Layton, uh, and Allen Ginsberg, and William Carlos Williams, for those who are keeping count. But uh, anyway, dozens of volumes later, Layton won two Nobel Prize nominations from Italy and uh, Japan, Italy's uh, Petrarch Prize for Poetry, and saw his work multiply as it was translated into, as I already mentioned, Italian and Greek. Uh, he passed away in 2006 at the age of 93 uh, in Montreal. Uh, so the Queen outlived him by only three years, but guess what? His years were more important than hers. I'm sorry. I'll just say that. His 93 years were more, way more important than her 96, which she kind of wasted. But anyway, all that to one side. Leonard Cohen was a pallbearer, a pallbearer uh, for his good friend and, and once mentor, once teacher, uh, Irving Layton. We are privileged uh, tonight to have Max Layton uh, recite uh, his uh, late father's poetry. We've had some technical difficulties, but I'm hopeful that at the very least uh, we will hear uh, uh, Max uh, recite uh, from his father's work. I'll, I'll t uh, read the last poem that we have up uh, from uh, Mr. Layton, Irving Layton, and that will be because you squeezed back, and then we'll have Dee Dee uh, play the song version of that poem. 
Uh, I know that Max has had trouble hearing us, but we can oh, hear okay. him. You're up now. I'm on? Yep. Well, we've had some real technical difficulty right now. I feel like I'm reading into the void. I don't hear anything. So I'm just going to do my best to read a few poems, and then I'm really sorry. I'm hoping all this is being videoed, and I'll be able to see everything later on YouTube. I hope that's true. Yes. Uh, and maybe it's true and maybe it isn't. I don't know. I'll find out. Um, the poems that I've uh, chosen to read have a, a theme that I think is important in my father's work. It's an overlooked aspect of his work. You know, he's mainly famous for his Dionysian exuberance, his love of life, that sort of thing. You know, a fighter and a brawler, uh, you know, uh, very much uh, absorbed by the sexuality and sensuality of this world. Uh, but actually, the first poem I'm going to read, I think, shows a different aspect of his work, or it allows you to see it in a different light. The poem is called The Birth of Tragedy, and that's the title of a famous book by Friedrich Nietzsche, and that reminds us of the Nietzschean idea of on the one side, there is the Dionysian world of exuberance, of the Dionysian frenzy. But on the other hand, there is the Apollonian world of permanence, of transcendence, of perfection, of art. And oddly enough, when you listen to the poems that I've selected, you'll see that when push comes to shove, when my father actually has to choose between the Dionysian and the Apollonian, he chooses the Apollonian, and that's something that you don't often hear talked about when people refer to my father's poetry. The birth of tragedy, and me happiest when I compose poems. Love, power, the huzzah of battle are something, are much. Yet a poem includes them like a pool, water, and reflection. In me, nature's divided things, tree, mold on tree, have their fruition. I am their core. Let them swap, bandy, swerve, like a flame swerve. I am their mouth, as a mouth I serve. And I observe how the sensual moths, big with odor and sunshine, dart into the perilous shrubbery or drop their visiting shadows upon the garden I one year made of flowering stone to be a footstool for the perfect gods, who, friends to the ascending orders, sustain all passionate meditations and call down pardons for the insurgent blood. A quiet madman, never far from tears, I lie like a slain thing under the green air the trees inhabit, or rest upon a chair towards which the inflammable air tumbles on tiny robin's wings, noting how seasonably leaf and blossom uncurl and living things arrange their death while someone from afar off blows birthday candles for the world. Leave taking. Again, the love of life contrasted with poetry. Goodbye, fields, waves, hills, trees, and fair weather birds whose blasts woke me each morning at dawn so that I might see the early sun. Goodbye, sun. I am growing older. I must instruct myself to love you all with moderation. May you be as kind to the next poet who comes this way as you have been to me. When you see him, give him my felicitations and love. Maxie, this is a poem he wrote for me when I was just a boy. And again, the contrast is with the energetic skin and bones that he describes in this poem, 
versus the eternality of art and being confronted by this Dionysian, Dionysian energy uh, gives him a turn for sculptured stone. Son, braggart, and thrasher is the cock's querulous strut in air and aggression. At sight of him is at the sound of raw. My mind half creates tableaus, seas, immensities. Mornings I've seen his good looks drop into the spider's mitre, pinned up between stem and stem. All summer the months grovel and bound at his heels like spaniels. All seasons are occult toys to him, a thing he takes out of the cupboard. Certain there are no more than two, at the most four. I suppose, spouse, what I wanted was to hold the enduring folds of your dress. Now there's this, this energetic skin and bones. You'll see, he'll pummel the two of us to death, laughing at our wrinkled amazement. Yes, though his upthrust into air is more certain than delight or unreason, and his active pell-mell feet scatter promises, elations of breast and womb, yet his growing up so neighborly to grass, us, and qualifying cobwebs has given me a turn for a sculptured stone. And I'd like to end with a beautiful poem, beautiful love poem that he wrote for the last woman in his life, not my mother, not my stepmother, but the last woman in his life, Anna Potier. It's called, I Take My Anna Everywhere. I take my Anna everywhere. She is so beautiful she can break a man's heart with a look, the proud thrust of her shoulder. She tells me she will die young. I tell her, all beautiful women have the same premonition. Brevity is the stamp of beauty, sealing it in the mouths of men. I take my Anna everywhere. She has the unpitying gaze of a goddess. And the men who see her want to live their wrecked lives forever. Thank you, everybody. I'm so sorry that I can't hear your questions. I would love to answer anything you had to say. It's, it's a tragedy from my point of view that uh, the sound just isn't working. So I'm, I'm going to say goodbye. I hope you enjoyed the reading, and I hope some little insight that I had there is helpful to you. Good night. I'll see you on YouTube later. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Max. That was a great reading, and I'm so sorry that you cannot hear us, but we heard you. And that was a very powerful rendition of your uh, great poet uh, father's uh, attitudes towards life and death and art and love and uh, carnality uh, and and adoration of women, adoration of fertility in nature, uh, as well as human uh, capacities for joy and enjoyment and wrath and outrage. Uh, your late father's poetry is very much like uh, his persona, at least in public, which was to be outspoken, to be larger than life, uh, to speak whatever he wanted to feel he should speak. And, and never hold back. Uh, uh, the poem that you have kindly consented to allow uh, D.D. Jackson, the maestro, to uh, record a song for is one that he, uh, Irving Layton, uh, your late father, wrote for his uh, second wife, uh, whose name is Harriet Bernstein. And uh, when they met, uh, he was 62 and she was 26. So a kind of nice reversal in the ages there. But in any event, they, they met in an elevator at York University where he was teaching a course in creative writing. And while riding the elevator from one floor to another, uh, uh, he squeezed her hand because they were surreptitiously holding hands. 
and she squeezed back. So that's the genesis of this poem. And uh, of course, um, I'll try to give you Irving Layton's voice, although I can't, but here it is. Because you squeezed back for Harriet. Because, oh yes, you squeezed back and my hand became liquid fire in the crowded ascending elevator, melting gold. Here we are in Paola eating snappers, basil and garlic spiced our converse with the three Italians seated at the next table, billowing like light summer clouds over heated fields. Buono, molto buono, bellissimo, not Leopardi, not Montali, not even Fellini, gifted and fat, could have written a more surprising scenario. Uh, that's Irving Layton. He wrote this poem, or at least published it, in 1977. And now, over to Dee Dee Jackson. All right. Well, let me let the song speak for itself. Uh, that was a lovely rendition, uh, George. Thank you so much. And uh, here we go. I'm going to mute my voice. So if for some reason people can't hear the song when I do this, which I assume won't be a problem, but if it is, let me know immediately and I will stop. No more technical difficulties, I promise. Really? Okay, here we go. Because, oh yes, you squeezed back and my hand became liquid fire. Oh yes, you squeezed back and my hand became liquid fire. In the crowded ascending elevator, melting gold. In the crowded ascending elevator, melting gold. Because, oh yes, you squeezed back and my hand became liquid fire. Oh yes, you squeezed back and my hand became liquid fire. In the crowded ascending elevator, melting gold. In the crowded ascending elevator, melting gold. Here we are in Paola, eating snappers, basil and garlic spice. Our converse with the three Italians seated at the next table billowing like light summer clouds over heated fields bueno molto bueno bellissimo not Leopardi not Montale, not even Fellini, gifted and fat, could have written a more surprising scenario. Because, oh yes, you squeezed back. Whoa, ho, ho. <laughs> Whoa -ho! it is just like that. Uh -huh. Just like that. Uh, Dee Dee, thank you.
thank you. I've got to ask you a question. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Max is no longer able to be with us to engage in a dialogue with you. So yeah. Yeah. I'll ask this. Of course, I sent you, as usual, I sent you a, a, a package of poems and, and you made your selection. So what drew you to choose this poem in particular? Um, well, it, it's interesting because when you're trying to choose uh, the, the right one, and I have to say it is a luxury to have a choice, right? To be able to find one that will work uh, ideally to be set into music. Um, I don't know, you wanna find something that uh, you feel like you can contribute something to uh, the poem that otherwise uh, in other situations might not even really need music. Not that this needs it, but I mean, it just makes it a whole nother thing that, that uh, is a nice collaborative uh, end product. And there were so many that were just standalone poems and, and you know, much more involved poems and going into many different directions. So this one was very uh, just like lovely to me and capturing a moment in time and very romantic. And I love the, the Italian illusions, which uh, my wife, who is Italian uh, American, uh, third generation, and I, you know, I've played in Italy many times, you know, could relate to as well. Um, so just on that level alone, uh, its simplicity and its, uh, you know, very specific emotion uh, appealed to me very much. So it was fun to be able to write something in that style. Well, I just loved it. And I, and I also loved those, those uh, the Italian references and so on. Mm. Uh, and you're shouting out uh, uh, <laughs> the sounds of conversation in a restaurant and paola uh, yeah. and so on. I'm probably mispronouncing it. I don't mean to suggest paola. I just mean yes. paola, Italia, <laughs> uh, right on. Uh, so uh, uh, I know we have to move on. It's always amazing to me how much time uh, just seems to go so quickly, but then also wonderfully and beautifully. Uh, but I'm just wondering if, if Gavin would like to throw in a word or two or question. Yeah, no, I, I, I was just thinking, you know, it's, a, it's amazing that how the Italian connections actually come together, uh, George, it just, you know, and Italy was one of those two countries that nominated Irving Layton for the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so there's there's that. There's his love of Italy. There's this moment in this love affair, uh, which is set in you know uh, in this Italian setting. Uh, and then there's Dini with his connection that is personal, which is just these things come together in the most serendipitous way. We 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 did not plan that. George is an extraordinary planner, but you know that that who who knew <laughs> that, that that just happened on its own, and that's the magic of poetry and music coming together. So, uh, Didi, thank you, George. Uh, I was just going to say we can take a short, you know, three minute bio break. Don't okay. go anywhere. You know, uh, if this if you want to if you have a glass of wine, you need to refill. God, God knows I do. After As a matter of fact, I do. <laughs> I do have a glass of wine. I'm going to run downstairs and refill. So you're right, Gavin. Let's just have a quick break, three minutes. But before, uh, don't anybody go away because we've got to hear, you've got to hear Micheline Mailer. You've got to hear Micheline Mailer. You're going to be blown away by by her poetry and Dee Dee's rendition of her, of her song. And then, uh, of course, uh, we have Bruce Meyer. Oh, my God, you're going to love it because... The, the stories of romance and turmoil, uh, not, not just romance, but turmoil, which I know that nobody watching or listening this evening has ever experienced romantic turmoil. It always happens to other people, which is a good thing that it only happens to other people. But from time to time, you might want to hear a description of, romantic, of some romantic turmoil. So we got that coming up. We have more romance uh, coming up as well as, uh, as well as, uh, a presentation through Libby Shire's poetry of, of the unfortunate facts of reality such as WAR, war. And, and uh, so her poetry kind of reflects on that too. And then we'll have a chance to talk about everything. But anyway, I shouldn't keep on talking. Gavin, you are right. Uh, we'll, t we'll take a break, uh, three minutes yes. refill as we need to. And uh, we are coming back. So don't anybody go, please. Yeah. For sure, and and I just wanted to mention it, Jennifer Lovegrove is going to be doing Libby's poetry when when, uh, so thank you thank you Jennifer for being here to do that. Uh, we've got some amazing stuff. We've got some amazing stuff, um, and I hope uh, I hope Bruce is I don't know if Bruce was able to make it in tonight, but I know that they were hope I know they had signed up. Uh, I know he's not well enough to read. Uh, I'll be doing Bruce's poetry, all of that when we come back. So go get your wine. Go get your wine. Uh, <laughs> All right. All I'll right. see you back in a few minutes.
<laughs> anyway, thanks so much, George, uh, for creating this uh, weird, wacky event. Of course, leave it up to you to create a weird, wacky event. I feel like I have some really strong shoulders of giants to stand on, Al Moritz. I mean, he just has the most wonderful things to say about philosophy, society, and citizenship in his work. If you haven't read The Sparrow, it's one of my absolute top 10 favorite poetry books in Canadian lit. And then Irving Layton, of course, I studied him. And uh, one of my favorite moments was when he nailed the Gucci bag to the outdoor of his house to ward off the spirits of capitalism. So, I mean, if you don't know about Irving Layton, you got to know that little detail because it's pretty great. I'm reading tonight four poems out of my book called The Bad Wife. And this lovely art here is by the talented artist Anna Wyant, who is in the news a lot lately because her boyfriend is 50 years older than her. And his name is Larry Gogashian. <laughs> uh, but she's my friend and she's wonderful. And I'm reading out of this, this book about crashing a marriage and uh, Dee Dee will be creating the music to go along with it and as Dee Dee said you know it is is it amazing that he's been nominated five times no and I cannot believe the absolute uh, oral uh, diversity I'm hearing coming from this man tonight what a talent to be able to take this stuff and and wrangle it into song thank you Dee Dee Okay, here I'll go. How to become a bad wife. Start with the archetype of innocence. Start as the lawful good. Let the crack and dice fall on good favor. Start with a long white sundress, strappy sandals and bring a puppy. Flirt. Look wide-eyed at the world with brown swirling fingers. Point at dreams and purple mountain bluebells. Use brown sugar in your coffee, sweeten everything. Once you are sure you're being followed by the man, let the tan of your ankle show. Hide the barnyards of your life in the hem of your skirt. Daub light pink eyeshadow from Shopper's Drug Mart in the corner of your lids. Appear fresh. You must look good to really make the effects last before you turn dark. Turn dark after the vows. Wait until the firstborn and the secondborn secure your sweetness in their DNA. Then experience the rock slide of your own heart skiff across doubt's surface. Slide slowly, gather dirt and wounds. Stay calm and frightening a temple guardian of the heart. Envision lizards running on water, panic at your own life. Find someone to talk to, a nice professor much older than you. Always safe, go somewhere with coffee. Be sure the children are with the babysitter. Start sinking, not skimming. Become an unreliable narrator. Find danger as water invades your ears, sunlight loyal above you, see patterns on the surface ripple and shake. Here is the diaphanous. Find yourself drowned, utter your own epitaph from underneath the seas. Here lies, here lies the bad wife. And this second one is called Never Thought. Never Thought. I have been having home wreck dreams of you. I've got an inside view from our big window. This is a metaphor, of course, not manufacture yet. We stay shrouded in clouds of disaster. Dust in the loader bucket, the ideal view ruins itself. This dream is all I could pull out of the dark. A toothy wild punk drunk at the controls. I get ornery when unprotected. I am the wife at a party guarded by friends' husbands who have more vigilant shoulders. Some big bully wants me for his own. You have such smiling dimples when you watch. Over there in the corner, you eye the trespasser. He drives right into your marriage and you watch. 
And this third one is called inclement weather. Have you seen the sky turn on a rocky cliff face? Cobalt silk morph into dappled gray hide. Seen the sky muddle beyond metaphor. Remember, I loved you spectacularly. From the, tide, from the time I spied you mowing your lawn in your underwear to another time your body slipped in the air, turned and sprung off the edge of our vacation boat, backflips for the children, circus tricks, turns of impatience and longing while ours sat peacefully in cross-inhabited rooms. CBC and the speakers droning the news, almost the same as yesterday, so samey is the turning of the world, so full of human nature churning. Those days smutched to years, spread soft and grassed green. But let's forget none of it was a waste. Let's not forget the mercury moodiness of weather over the slim sliced schist jammed sidelong into the continent. Our marriage is here for the millennia of our lives. It too has a drift, a motion told in geologic time, a fault line. I have felt the color of your mood in my breast, the ways you despise me now, trample down the highway, punch hooves into my chest. But I have not forgotten your beauty or the lilies you found at Safeway late on Mother's Day or the sun bleached glacial tint of your eyes, the talks we hushed in the bathroom, private and loving, where our, well, our children slept in night dimmed rooms, hallways away, safe then from me, from us. There is much to mourn and even more to say, but now silence needs the length of time, the forge of memory. I have not forgotten the way clouds scud off the mountain tops and shift a whole sky, the same way tides scramble oceans. You will never be wrong in our children's DNA. We have all of time to sit together in those cells patiently, all the stories of our past still in synchronicity. Let those remembrances be bomb enough for what has become of our bombed out home, empty of my things and the rhythms we kept. Tell your son you loved me once and all the sky is still in motion. Do you see the weather shift? Even now, thunderheads might break into blue. All right. And this is a song now. <laughs> this last poem is called So Say I. Wow, I can't even believe, I've heard it, so I can't even believe what you're going to hear next. This is crazy. So Say I. Say I will, say I do, dooby 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 do. Say seashell, say ambergris, say wibbledy wobbledy, say chabli. Say French blue, say skinnamarinka dinka do, I love you. Say verdigris, say university, say auburn, say wimple, say I'm not a saint. Say dipshit, say mistake, say I tried, say you gave up, say whatever you need to move on. Say excuse, say weariness, say something hard to swallow. Say a prayer to your atheist friend. Say Windex and never see clearly again. Say morning, say take it back. Would I take it back? Say I take it back. Would you take me back? Say handshake, say lawyer, say sign right here on the flag lines, say bed sheet, say ticking, say time bomb, say bourbon, say the name on your cusp of your fiery swill, say swing set, say tree stump, say sunset, say it like you mean it. Oh, I meant it when I said it. And now for yeah. Dee Jackson. <laughs> All right, here, here, here's the song version. Bottom, 
Ba-dum, ba-dum, ba Ba-dum, 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 ba Say I will, say I do Dooby 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 doo Say seashell and ambergris Say wibble bobble, say chablis Say French blue Say skidamarink a doo I love you Ba-da 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 ba Say fair degree, say university Say Auburn, say Wimple, say I am not a saint Say dipshit, say mistake Say I tried, say you gave up Say whatever you need to move on Ba-da 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 ba Ba-da 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 ba Say excuse, say weariness, say something hard to swallow Say a prayer to your atheist friend Say Windex, never see clearly again Say take it back, would I take it back? Say I take it back, would you take me back? Say handshake, say lawyer, say sign right here on the flag lines. Say bed sheets, say ticking, say time bomb. Say bourbon, say my name on the cusp of a fiery swill. Say swing set, say tree stump, say sunset, say it like you mean it. Oh, I meant it when I said it. Okay, look at um, I gotta I gotta ask uh, Micheline what you thought when you first heard that rendition of your poem. But before you answer, I gotta say this: you describe yourself correctly as being experimental, but sometimes, sometimes experimental is a euphemism for not accomplished. In your case, experimental is accomplished. Absolutely. That I mean, the stuff you read, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. But I come back to my question. What did you think when you when you first heard this? I had the biggest smile on my face because I was like, you know, with poetry, the reason I fell in love with poetry is because somebody else said what I was thinking, but they said it in a way that I thought, damn. You took my thoughts and made them better. And that's what D.D. Jackson did. He took my poem and he cab Calloway that. He just just scattered that thing. And I was like, yeah, that's what it's like. It's like beautiful chaos. He just nailed it. I was just delighted. I was just delighted in every possible way. Wow. What a talented man. And George... You, you are the inspiration for this poem to begin with because you were telling me about sound and gospel in that basement kitchen, like in Saskatchewan. <laughs> <laughs> so, at, mwah, you at the monastery, man. we were we were at a poetry workshop in a monastery, and the yeah. popes, the then popes' representative, dropped by and had to borrow my my laptop connection in order to do some stuff for the Vatican. But I luckily had everything that was sorted white. 
before I before I let him get access to anything. I'm sorry, mm-hmm. I had to I had to do it. I didn't want him to carry bad news about me back to the Vatican. Anyway, we, <laughs> we had a, we had a great time, uh, and the poetry was was wonderful that was happening. Uh, but I I also I got to ask uh, Dee Dee, uh, how did you how did you get to this? Well. You know, I, I don't know if uh, people heard, we might have said this before the break was over, but I I, um, I was actually doing some research uh, into Micheline's uh, poetry, and, and I found a performance she did uh, similar to what you just did now uh, of this poem, which was a ridiculous bonus. Uh, I don't think that, I think that's the first time with any of the poets, any of the 12 songs I've written for 12 different poems uh, where that's been the case, uh, other than maybe you, George. And um, and so, you know, when I heard it, it was like the rhythm of this is like totally just like a fast bebop beat poetry vibe already, you know? So that's why I say um, she could almost recite it on top of it and it would almost, you know, match up in a way. I mean, that was sort of the goal to capture, to me, to capture the, you know, to, to musicalize it, but to capture the spirit that was already inherent uh, in, in, on a variety of levels, not just rhythmically, of course, but word wise and sort of the, the sardonic, you know, cynical, but amusingly cynical quality at times and, you know, the, the exasperations and the whole, you know, just taking you through the entire um, story of the relationship and so on. So, uh, so no, it's really exciting uh, to have an opportunity to, to, to do a piece like that and, and to try to underscore what, what she wrote, for sure. Uh, uh, before we move on, I just got to say, uh, what a wonderful bookend, so to speak. I mean, we had uh, Because She Squeezed Back and then So Say I? Yeah. So Say So Say I. I'm always getting confused when I'm like, so, so I say, so say I. Uh, but but the two are really like wonderful uh, uh, connections to e- to each other. Um, but uh, as I as I mentioned, and unfortunately, I mean, time always seems to go so fast, and yet at the same time, it is so immensely enjoyable. But we do have to uh, uh, go along. Um, but uh, and of course, we have next uh, Bruce Meyer. But I never want to leave Gavin out. Gavin, is there? Uh, and I can't leave Gavin out. Is there something else that you'd like to say about what we just heard? I, I, I you know, God bless, God bless the bad wife. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, we we got we got so much good from that. Uh, both of you, Micheline, Didi. Actually, there was music all the way through. You know. In the reading, and in the in in the in the playing in the in the actual comp- composition, so uh, just so much pleasure and, and joy to be had from that. Thank you. That, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it's just superb, superb all all the way around. And and uh, yeah, I mean, you think about it. I, I initially mentioned Cap Calloway, and you think about it, the jazz men and women, the jazz men and women had relationships that were sometimes stormy and at the very least unconventional. And I, and I think that really came across I, uh, with the poem, with the poet and, and, and um, uh, her, her husband. And, and then at the music uh, takes us right back as well to all those uh, uh, discourses on relationships amongst, amongst jazz players. And, and, um, uh, so yeah, it, it's a fundamentally uh, uh, very uh, extremely relevant for a lot of us. I I'll hasten to add, and and I think uh, Didi, your cadences uh, uh, really caught the the actual bebop nature of so many relationships um, in the in the uh, millennium, the new millennium. So uh, thank you both uh, for those contributions. So we will move on. I'm sorry. I know. I I don't really want to have to keep on pushing us forward, but we do need to keep on no, going you forward. You did the right thing, George. Thank so you here, for doing that. Here is Bruce Meyer. Born April 23rd, 1957. He is a Canadian poet, broadcaster, and educator, among other roles in the Canadian literary scene. He has authored more than 64 books of poetry. At the beginning of the evening, Gavin, you mentioned that I had published 60 books. No. I have not published 60 books. Bruce Meyer has published more than 60 That's books. Right. I'm That's way right. back in the, I'm way back in, uh, he's passed me, surpassed me a long time ago. So I'm way back behind. But uh, uh, the 64 books are poetry, short fiction, nonfiction, literary journalism. He's taught at Georgian College in Barrie and at Victoria College at the University of Toronto. His CBC radio appearances remain the broadcaster's 
best-selling spoken word CD series and inspired his 2000 bestseller, The Golden Thread, A Reader's Journey Through the Great Books. And it is an astonishing book. He has organized uh, dozens of literary conferences and festivals, and his works have been published in Canada, the United States of America, the United Kingdom, Ireland, Switzerland, Italy, Spain, India, Pakistan, China, Nigeria, Bangladesh, Chile, Mexico, Yemen, Greece, Australia, Denmark, Netherlands, and have been translated into French, Spanish, Italian, Dutch, Danish, Hindi, Chinese, Urdu, Bangla, Greek, and Korean. Uh, Bruce is currently in uh, rehab, uh, having just gone through a surgery, a liver transplant. We are hopeful that he's well enough to listen in tonight and that he and his wife, uh, Carrie, may be uh, 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 following uh, tonight's uh, uh, readings and musical renditions. Before I hand everything over to Gavin for the reading of Bruce's poems, I'll say that Bruce Meyer is also a, a gentleman. He is also someone who goes the extra mile for his fellow and sister writers. I first met him almost 40 years ago, 1983. I stepped into a poetry reading in Toronto, uh, nobody, as I still am, from Halifax, and Bruce just welcomed me uh, with open arms, sat me down, got me some beer, and said, welcome, you're a poet, you are welcome at this gathering. And we have been friends ever since, and, and I see him as an extremely high aurora borealis when it comes to Canadian poetry, really stratospheric in his meaning and circumstance and importance. So um, over to you, Gavin. Thank, thanks, George. Uh, you know, I, I, I've, I have met Bruce only recently at the Lost, lo uh, the lost Launches that uh, Al Moritz uh, organized at the Art Bar series, which was for poets who had books launched during the during the pandemic, and uh, and it is a it is an immediate indication of the generosity that you spoke of, George. Uh, Bruce reached out to me, and and basically said the warmest, most welcoming things to me, uh, and I'm very grateful to that. Uh, that Uh, Gavin, are you are you still uh, uh, speaking? I think he froze. Yeah, I think so too. Um, okay, yes. can you hear me? Oh, I'm yes. back. Can you hear me? Wow. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah okay. Whoa. We're lost in technical cyber difficulties. Space. Yeah. This is there's some there's there's a jinx out there. Can you hear me now? You're you, we yes. Are good? And, and I see. Thank you. Yeah. That, and Carrie Johnson has written to everybody to say hi from Bruce. Carrie is Bruce's wife. So yes, uh, uh, all our wishes for Bruce's speedy uh, recovery go out to him and to and and Carrie. Uh, you know, all our support for you. Uh, this community is totally behind you. Bruce has done so much for it, and we all feel supported by him and by you. And so, really, uh, best all the best that we can possibly send you over the ether. Um, I'm actually nervous to be reading Bruce's poetry now that I know that he's on on here <laughs> listening uh, with Kerry. Uh, so forgive me. I, I I hope I will do you do you justice, Bruce. I am going to read uh, a set of poems and end with uh, Mavity Street. Uh, Bruce's poems are incredible. They are tender. Uh, they have they have just this perfect balance and rhythm within them, contained in you know. Uh, sort of they speak to each the lines speak to each other and then to us at the same time it's just incredible how how he does that uh, i just love the equilibrium and the poise and the and the musicality that's already in this in these poems and and didi you know in the poem that he chose to to compose for uh, i think identified exactly that so the first poem i'm going to read is the snow the snow time does not pass when snow is falling only the silence falls trees glisten trembling as a body trembles beneath a white sheet the cold room shock of warm hands feet twisted and touching feet 
the snow fell and settled on her hair diamonds to tell the story of her beauty silence in timelessness eyes saying stay her whispers wordless that night i woke to the silence of snow her arm was a season touching me white almost warm a light in darkness the first snow falling as only silence falls the world lies listening time passes as the seasons pass leaves sprouting their tragic wings november bravely shouting its hypnotic soliloquy to a december sky frail and innocent fear of first love as first things fail time stills in my mind like unbroken snow her face white and lovely at the window and uh next one I read is a poem against metaphors a poem against metaphors in memory of Thomas Tranströmer. So don't breathe. Don't think of a metaphor for breathing. And don't pretend to hear old echoes, echoes of old poems bouncing off the walls as one hears silence transforming itself into something so simple it cannot help but be mistaken for the real heartfelt sobbing of the man in the next apartment who punctuates silences between each sob with a cough or a train clacking over suburban tracks with one lonely woman sitting in the light of an empty carriage as she turns and looks up at you because for an instant you connect and you are not anything else than the one she holds in her mind. Some day you will get together, you, the man with the cough, the woman in the train window, and the train's engineer, and that persistent cough that won't go away, even though it is almost summer, and you recall the good time you spent in a coincidence when you were more than strangers, almost friends who shared a night, wished each other well, and promised to spend milliseconds together again and you will weep and laugh then go your separate ways as footsteps sotto voce in the night and uh, my second last poem is uh, again uh, you know it's so much i love about bruce's poetry uh, uh, you know he, this this poem is a poem let me explaining romanticism to my daughter which you know got me right where i live because you know i've got two daughters and uh you know love them to bits so and we talk poetry all the time explaining romanticism to my daughter it is always like snow falling in the heart and we both turn to stare out the window Flakes descend as softly as moonlight, but in the time it takes to watch the trees try to catch the broken sky in empty hands. The, will, the wind howls around the house and cries with the pain and pity of a grieving silence where the world must be rebuilt for life. It is the difference between the way snow fell and what it could tell you of its fall from heaven. And for the poem that Didi is going to play for you in a very short while, Mavity Street for Kerry. Mavity Street. When moonlight stole like guilty cats and summer owned the air i kissed your lips on mavity street 
and tousled your starlit hair. Grave windows on the darkened rows, the abandoned dairies shell cast off their grimy prose of life and wished to love as well. The old man in the Balkan hall looked up from losing hands. My love, I pledged on Malvady Street. More heart than head or glands. Your tiny flat was heaven's realm and the, the roof leaked sylvan streams. But you and me together there were was daylight to my dreams and moonlight stole the years away and summers drank the air. I thirst for that kiss on Matherty Street and the starlight in your hair. That was lovely. That is Bruce Meyer. Yeah, absolutely. All right, now the song version. Let me just go ahead and play it. Keep things moving here. Uh, that was lovely. Uh, here we go. I'm going to mute myself first. When moonlight stole like guilty cats and summer owned the air I kissed your lips on Mavity Street And tussled your starlit hair Grave windows on the darkened rows The abandoned dairy's shell Cast off their grimy prose of life And wished to lovers well The old man in the balcony hall Looked up from losing hands My love I pledged on Mavity Street, more heart than head or glance, more heart than head or glance. Your tiny flat was heaven's realm, the roof leaked sylvan stream. But you and me together there Was daylight to my dreams And moonlight stole the years away And summers drank the air I thirst for that kiss on Mavity Street And the starlight the old man in that balcony hall looked up from losing hands. My love I pledged on Mavity. More heart than head or glance More heart than head or glance Your tiny flat was heaven's realm The roof leaked sylvan stream but you and me together there Was daylight to my dreams And moonlight stole the years away 
and summers drank the air. I thirst for that kiss on Mavity Street and the starlight. Georgia, you, you're you're on mute. Okay, I was muted. I'm so sorry to myself for crying out. Let me say that song is so romantic, oh. it's so evocative of of how most of us uh, come to love and and even long term, even marital relationships. That is to say that we begin with a place of relative not having a whole lot of money. So you're in the tiny realm of the of the of the flat uh, and and your uh, courtship is basically walking down streets, holding hands, looking in each other's eyes, sitting by a river or a lake and maybe getting an ice cream or something. I, I mean, I, I think that 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 kind of those kinds of details about real people with real love in a real down to earth uh, situation. It's just so poignant and and I think really can touch a lot of us with, with a degree of nostalgia and so on. And in terms of poetry, I'm reminded of W.H. Auden. I'll have to go and look up the poem now, but he has a poem that has a similar structure. Uh, and I'm not just saying that to flatter Bruce because I, I do think this is a very, very fine poem that he has written. Uh, and in fact, it's so fine that I find this relationship to W.H. Auden and, and a similar ballad, not, not similar in terms of anything that the sentiment, but just structure, uh, which, which suddenly comes to mind. So I just wanted to share that. And Dee Dee, the melody is just so captivating and evocative and sweet and tender and moving uh, and, and rich. Uh, I, I I really I'm, I'm I like I said I'm speechless so I shouldn't be talking uh, so yeah. I'll I'll stop right there. Well, um, I have to say uh, this song actually may have been the the shortest like amount of time I've ever spent to write a song. Like I literally was just recording it and and you know it was just kind of coming to me as I was going because the piece just sort of played itself because the lyrics were so beautifully said and you know the pacing of the words already demanded a, a certain feeling to me of a melody and so on so so it was really quite a pleasure uh to write this piece and then after i actually did this version that you heard i i was like well that was that was too easy let me you know so i did i think i sent you a demo where it's like there's soprano sax and jazz you know like little brushes that come in later on and so on so there is another version already another arrangement that i may put on the cd <laughs> with real with real soprano sax instead of virtual soprano sax this time um but i thought that you know uh, this version was really the first way that I was kind of trying to conceptualize it. Uh, it captured, you know, the, the moment in time quality of, of what I was trying to go for. But just lovely, lovely words. And and also it read rhymed, not that anything needs to rhyme remotely for it to be set to music. But but because of that, it kind of did give it this classic structural quality on a musical level that made it easier again to kind of, you know, fit it into kind of a more traditional sort of uh, a recurring uh, a melodic structure. So that, so that made it very easy to write, I guess. But I love I, I, the words. You, you're so right, and I, and I love that idea about the classic structure because that's what I was trying to indicate by referring to W. H. Auden. There, there is this like classic ballad stanza or quatrain yeah. uh, in poetry as well as in music writing. And so when I sent you uh, the selection, yeah, um, it, 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 that was one of the poems like the, the very top of my of my list yes. because it was just cr it was already melodic. It was already yes. saying, "Dee Dee Jackson, please turn me into a song." It was already <laughs> screaming. It was out. already a song. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that was lovely, lovely sentiment in the poem and the, the sort of sense of I felt like there was a feeling of nostalgia for when the relationship was younger. So and yet it was also romantic. You know. 
inherent in the words in, in and of themselves at the same time. So, you know, just trying to capture that as best as I could. Romantic and, nostalgia. Uh, yeah. Almost makes you want to go back to the days of courting by subway in Toronto, but I don't yeah. really <laughs> want to go back there. I don't really want to go back there, but I like to think about it. I like to think about it. All right. Uh, we got I know we gotta move on, but Gavin. Yeah, no, I just very, very quickly, you know, I think there's a I I, I don't know if it's a broken tenderness or a tender brokenness you know in 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 bruce's poetry and i thought that you captured that Didi, in the in the rendition you had there was this vulnerability that in in in, in the music that just came through uh, and we look back on this on this relationship you know we 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 are in that first moment those first incredible powerful uh, moment this first you know, there's moments that just completely set us on fire and make give us the strength for all the years that follow. And then we now we're on the other end of the poem, we're looking back at it, and there is that vulnerability, that aging, that you know, that that wanting to find strength in that original yeah. place of you know warmth and fire. The longing, yeah, uh, yeah. It's it's beautiful. It's so it's so beautiful, and uh, both the poem and 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 the and the music. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's okay. I, I, I keep saying we, I know we got to move on, but I'll just say very quickly that it, it's sort of I'm not saying that you had anything like this in mind, Edie, or or that Bruce had anything like this in mind, but I'm reminded of Bob Dylan's take on on um, Frank Sinatra, the album he did about five years ago. I take all these torch songs and standards and and redoing them in some ways and and uh, people can have different a attitudes about that, but there is something to be said for for that classic approach uh, mm -hmm. to the love song, the love poem, the love ballad. Yeah. And I really think that that you you have really caught that, captured that in in this in this piece. I will say, uh, speaking of uh, pop influences, that I I think we talked about this with the piece from the first concert we did on Silence, <clears throat> that was influenced by the music of Sting. I'm a huge fan of Sting, so he has sort of a quality uh, to his writing. Uh, not his police stuff, but I mean more of his introspective later uh, work uh, that I I can't help but have in mind also in mood wise. Like if I were Sting, I, I, if I could hire him to sing the song, I probably would because he has that you know that kind of vibe. Um, so just to throw that in there too, that that was probably at least subconsciously on my mind as well. Let's approach him and see. <laughs> yes, you never know. Hey, I've got the Canon Council money now. Hey, Sting, uh, you want to uh, come on, man? That, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's a really cool insight, Sting. Yeah, I, I know we talked about that a couple of months ago, but but yeah, yeah now that you mentioned, I can I can hear a little a little bit of that uh, approach. And and finally, I just got to say, I I want to be walking down Mavity Street or Mavidi Street. I'm not sure. Is it? Well, I I look. The only reason I thought it was Mavidi was because I looked up like literally some real estate agents advertising the homes for sale and they're like on Mavidi street because i originally wrote it Mavity, so i'm happy to you know whichever way it is is what i will change it to well, so I, some, somebody who is actually is from toronto assuming that's the Mavidi street we're talking about tell them tell me well you know real estate agents are into poetry because i according to them i live in the upper beaches which uh -oh. basically all that means to me is that i miss most of the gall droppings yeah yeah, so yeah. That, that <laughs> but I'm pretty far from the beach. I got to tell yeah, you, yes. I'm pretty far. So the upper beaches, I, I don't know. Anyway, look, uh, I'm sorry for these digressions, but really enjoying everything tonight. And so we will move on. Our next poet, our our fifth poet, uh, is Libby Shire, and uh, she uh, uh, was born May 31, 1946, in Brooklyn, New York and unfortunately passed away uh, far too young, November 14, 2000. Uh, and she was educated at Sarah Lawrence College uh, with a BA uh, concentrating in French and philosophy and at the State University of New York at Stony Brook with a Master of Arts in English 1971. She held several offices in the Writers Union of Canada, Ontario representative and national council member in 1986 to 88 and chair of the Rights and Freedoms Committee, 1988 to 89. I think that's really important. I want to underline that because we in Canada take our rights and freedoms way too lightly, I just want to say. So I'm glad that she was someone who, who was really 
uh, strong and, and stalwart in championing our rights and freedoms. At Penn International, Canadian Centre, Anglo, she was a member of Writers in Prison Committee. That's another thing too. We tend to enjoy the idea of locking up um, uh, convicts, offenders, and throwing away the key as the old right wing mantra goes. I'm waiting. I'm ready for the day when Pierre Paul Yev has to go behind mm -hmm. uh, bars with his friend Donald Trump. But anyway, all that to one side. Um, and uh, she was a. Uh, 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 and so I just want to underline the fact that it's important that we be able to uh, 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 work with uh, um, uh, prisoners and and help to uh, find their rehabilitation through art. She also belongs to the League of Canadian Poets, Modern Language Association, and the Canadian Union of Educational Workers. She moved to Toronto in 1975 after living in France uh, and Cal in California and in Israel, and she died as was already mentioned, unfortunately, in the year 2000, way too young. Uh, her poems are being read tonight by Jennifer Love Grove, who's a protege of <laughs> Libby Shire. And, and, uh, and of course, we will be hearing uh, Dee Dee Jackson's uh, song to uh, one of Libby Shire's poems, uh, The Father's Dream Later. I'll also mention that she's the mother of Governor General's award-winning poet, Jacob Shire, who is listening uh, tonight uh, from uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba, to which he has just uh, recently moved. Thank you so much, George. Thanks, everyone, for being here tonight. And I'm so honored to be able to share Libby's work uh, with all of you and be part of this event. Um, I have a little fun story that I will share in a moment of how I first uh, discovered Libby's work and then later was one of her students. Um, so I'm going to read three of her poems tonight. The first one is Sociology, as requested uh, by Jacob, her son. Hi, Jacob. And then I'm going to read one that was a favorite of mine uh, in high school, actually, when I acquired her book, Second Nature. Uh, and then I'm going to read the poem that the song is based on. So first is Sociology. There can be useful byproducts of an economic depression. When money loses value, sometimes values gain value. But for every newly poor person who gets in touch with the gods for the first time, 10 people become muggers and five of these rapists while they're at it. For every newly poor person who gives away belongings to someone poorer, 10 people become street hustlers dealing in dope or flesh or confidence games. For every newly poor person who tries to organize the block to march on City Hall, 10 people stay under the sheets all day. For every newly poor person who develops a heart of gold, the hearts of 10 others turn rotten from envy, greed, and bitterness. For every newly poor angel, 10 devils. But last night, I dreamt that good has 10 times the power of evil. One thing I love so much about this book is her astonishing range from between political anger to feminism to neo-surrealism and humor. Um, so I'm going to read one tonight that is that that embodies kind of all of those things, but particularly the humor. Um, and my my quick first connection to Libby's work came when I was in high school. I grew up in a really small town. It was a terrible place. I worked in the public library in that town, which was kind of my saving grace. And every week I would I would scour the poetry section, hoping, hoping that there would be something new that wasn't someone very ancient and long dead. And there never was uh, until one day there was this book, Second Nature by Libby Shire. And I did what any self-respecting teenage poet would do. And after I fell in love with it, I promptly stole it. Uh, and a few years later became her student at York University. And I wanted so much to tell her that, um, but then I was kind of scared and I was shy. And I thought, well, you know, that's maybe not a cool thing to do because then I'm depriving others of, of her work by stealing the book. Uh, so I waited till the last class. And, and I told her, and she said, oh my God, you grew up in that town? 
thank God you got out. That was a terrible place. Thank you for, thank God you stole my book. Thank you for doing that. So uh, then, you know, I didn't feel bad about it anymore. So I'm gonna read the poem that I regaled my friends often in high school with uh, called Cotton Bowl New Year's Day. I have finally understood why I don't understand North America. It has to do with football. I understand the rules of baseball. Boxing is clear if nasty and violent. Golf, swimming, tennis, and all the other ways people show off individual prowess, all these are clear. Football is beyond me. Entire groups of heavily padded men, men who are large to begin with, collide with each other. They crouch like bulls, heads aimed at heads, run a few feet and crash. Then someone blows a whistle. Everybody gets up and brushes the dust off. Sometimes someone is carried away. Occasionally, one of the large young men gets disgusted, grabs the ball and runs like hell to the end of the field. The spectators go wild. No wonder. It is the only interesting thing they've seen in two hours and it's the middle of winter. Their feet are cold as shit. It feels good to stand up and stamp them and yell. This part of football is clear. The man running alone, the people stamping and shouting, but then the collisions that accomplish nothing begin again. How easily the spectators accept this, slide under the blankets again and let their asses freeze. And then on top of everything, there are big parades before the game. These are like Santa Claus parades with a little skin action. I heard once that the Dallas cowgirls are housewives who spend all their time washing dishes and feeding half-wit husbands, except for when they flip their skirts for fat old men on the 50-yard line. I can see why this is a welcome diversion for both the cowgirls and the old men. A popular item at halftime is the large marching band or section in the stands with flashing cards. They turn themselves into flags, slogans, and various insignia. From a distance, they look like an army of ants who have lost a sense of purpose, but keep repeating familiar routines, hoping they will remember something important they have forgotten. Forgive me for belaboring the obvious, but football symbolizes the North American power structure. All those large men padded so they seem even larger, colliding with other padded men, everybody getting nowhere, and lots of noisy music and foolishly dressed women to disguise the fact that nothing useful is happening. Mm. I think my dog Edgar is trying to participate in the reading. So if you <laughs> hear that little soft howl in the background, that's what that is. Um, so the final poem I'm gonna read is the one that uh, Dee Dee Jackson's song is based on, The Father's Dream. The dark, cold basement in Bukovina, soldiers, boots, black potatoes, spring mud, the sound, shh the crack of laughter in the black wound of a soldier's open mouth, the black eye of the gun barrel against my blue eye, and the eyelid descends a shroud for the eyeball, and my ears wait for the crack of the gun, and the whoosh of my eye out of the back of my head, but the only crack is the crack of laughter in the black wound of the soldier's open mouth and the sky breaks into yellow storm clouds, bile, vomit, mucus, blood, the flesh smelling earth sprayed in my face. And once again, I am not dead like the others who are. All right, lovely. I, okay. Song version coming up, uh, but very, very lovely to hear you read. The dark cold basement and book of soldiers boots Black potatoes spring mud, the sound. Shh. The crack of laughter in the 
black wound of a soldier's open mouth the black eye of the gun barrel against my blue eye the dark cold basement in Bukovina Eyelid descends, a shroud for the eyeball, and my ears wait for the crack of the gun and the whoosh of my eye out of the back of my head. only crack is the crack of laughter in the black wound of the soldier's open mouth and the sky breaks into the yellow storm clouds Bile vomit mucus blood The flesh smelling earth sprayed in my face And once again I am not dead Like the others who are The dark cold basement in Bukovina Descends a shroud for the eyeball, and my ears wait for the crack of the gun and the whoosh of my eyes out of the back of my head. Let the only crack. Is the crack of laughter in the black wound of the soldier's open mouth? And the sky breaks into yellow storm clouds, bile vomit, mucus, blood, the flesh smelling sprayed in my face and once again I am not dead like the others who are the dark cold basement in Bukovina Um, <laughs> wow. Um, it's actually difficult to, to, um, express a reaction to that piece that, that can be confused for ecstasy, uh, given the, the, uh, very bluesy, uh, and grim subject matter. But my reaction is just simply noting uh, the incredible sympathy, Didi, that you bring to your rendition of A Nightmare. And a nightmare that is very relevant as we hear the news from Ukraine, uh, as we hear the news from other conflict areas in the world. And as we understand that the impact of these conflicts will be to create 
Unfortunately, new generations or a new generation of potential abusers, of potential rapists, of potential murderers, uh, which is really the source of the inspiration uh, for that poem uh, by Libby Shire, The Father's Dream. Uh, she's reacting to her own account of, of uh, childhood sexual abuse uh, at the, uh, unfortunately, hands of her father. Uh, and what's interesting about this poem for me is that The Father's Dream is basically uh, Libby Shire's attempt to understand the things that influenced, the forces that influenced her father to perhaps uh, behave in the ways, the criminal ways that he did. And uh, the, the very uh, uh, poignant melody that you have given this poem helps to underscore the idea, as we've all recognized from various news reports, that the violent trauma of children is visited upon new generations of children going forward. Uh, that's not only true in terms of children of, of war, but for that matter, um, uh, people like myself, uh, descendants of slavery. And of course, there's now uh, lots of studies about post-slavery traumatic disorder. Yes, post-slavery traumatic disorder. Uh, I'll just say, I'm, I'm talking too much. So I'm going to shut up in a moment, but I just got to say, like, this poem speaks to me because I'm five generations. I was born in 1960. But even though I was born in 1960, 62 years ago, I'm only five generations removed from emancipation in the United States. I need people to know that. I'm only five generations removed. So the people who dealt with the initial uh, reactions to being enslaved and the feelings and emotions and trauma that they suffered reverberate down to my generation and generations after uh, as scholars are beginning to understand. So I think that Libby Shire's poem really points to the longevity, uh, unfortunate longevity of all kinds of trauma, but she has gotten at it at, at such a, in such a sensitive and imagistic way. Uh, and you have as well. And I want to thank Jennifer Love Grove for that very uh, poignant and sensitive reading of all of the poems uh, by Libby Shire. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. Yeah. Um, I, I, this is why you're the poet, George, because I mean, you expressed it perfectly already. Uh, capturing the sentiment. Um, I mean, for me, a lot of it was the, the the material that you sent me, but it's so sensitive and so deeply personal. And this this poem allowed me the opportunity to explore it, as you suggested, but in a more universal sort of way, you know, like the horrors of, of war itself in a way, and how it relates to what the content of, uh, you know, the, the the motivation of why the poem was most likely written, although I, I, I you know, don't want to speak for, for the author, of course. Um, and, um, but for me to, to, you know, to do something like this on a musical level, for what it's worth, uh, the challenge was to not make it unnecessarily overly melodramatic to keep it very sustained and very reflective not to make it overdone because it didn't need to be it's just the, the horrors spoke for themselves in a way um so you know for what it's worth just to share that um you know idea conceptually what i was going for it was really about keeping it keeping the emotion you know a feeling of suspension and reflection and not overly melodramatic and hopefully the horror kind of comes out even more uh, in, in, by doing that. Um, so, um, yeah, it was a very uh, emotional uh, piece to write. So I was very happy to have the chance to do so. And, you know, so, so thank you. Uh, I need to ask, uh, Jennifer, how did you feel um, uh, in terms of approaching the poem in your, in your uh, very uh, delicate and but also at the same time uh, determined uh, reading of those of those lines and and your take on how Dee Dee has interpreted uh, the poetry. Oh, the interpretation in the song is just like everyone's saying in the chat, just so profoundly powerful and such a, a as Dee Dee said, universal yet empathetic and sensitive take on it. Um, I'm just yeah, really honored to be able to represent her work by reading it tonight and. Yeah, that is what I think is so stunning about her writing is the the massive range that she's able to capture within 
a single book, within a single poem, within a single line, even between the horrors of intergenerational traumas and personal traumas, global political traumas, yet with such ferocity and beautiful imagery and yet humor. So yeah, you can imagine how much of an impact that had on me finding it as a teenager pre-internet, remember. Um, so yeah, no, it's just a stunning, a stunning rendition and just a great night all around. Um, so thank you for for asking me to step in on, on Libby's behalf and Jacob's. Well, uh, thank you so much again. I just want to say as well that I had not, uh, I did not know about the football poem. I got to call it that, but your reading of it was was just resonant. And that, and really, Classic. That, that was, <laughs> it, it's stunning. And, and the analysis is still so correct. It uh, feels almost more resonant now than it did when I discovered it, what, over 30 years ago. <laughs> holy smokes, wow. Well, that's the power of good poetry is that it, it's always relevant, right? And and so I, I see that in what you read uh, in everything that you've read uh, and also in Dee Dee's treatment of the father's dream. Um, wow. Uh, what a, a legacy that you have, have represented, Jennifer. And and, uh, uh, and that, that melody, Dee Dee, it just sinks into your marrow. It's it's so touching and, Thank and you. profound. That was also the highest, just as an aside, the highest I've ever sang. But I, I you know, I, I often write songs in different keys, just whatever feels intuitive. And um, normally I would have modulated it into a lower register, but because it was a dream and I wanted it to sound otherworldly, I left it up there. So there was a challenge for you uh, on a musical level. <laughs> now, you, you know, I've said this before, but I, I, I just sort of like heard a little bit of early Elton John. Early. Uh, probably, yeah. Before it became like a glitz glamour rocker. There was, there yeah, was yeah. This, this early, early 1970s Elton John that, that was very spare mm. and and stripped down and exact on the emotions mm. uh, that he would be exploring uh, in, in those early Bernie Topin songs. Mm. So I, I heard that too. Mm. Uh, I, I will uh, quickly uh, investigate those songs more so I can retroactively <laughs> suggest that they have influenced me. But uh, no, I mean, I, Elton John, I'm certainly a fan of his, but I don't know if I know the early stuff as much. I should have checked it out the last time you said that, because now you've made me even more curious to check it out. The, uh, the album in question is Elton John, the eponymous album from 1970. I, yes, 70. I am uh, checking that out. Too sweet. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. George, it's it's your turn now, my friend. Oh my oh, god. Yes, one more, one more. Everybody always thinks that <laughs> yeah, one more. Uh, Everybody thinks that we're done, but there's one more. Uh, there is one more. There's George bonus, 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 bonus poem. A bonus poem. Yes. Uh, look, uh, I'm so happy to be able to participate uh, as a poet of this evening, and I also want to thank Dee Dee so very very much uh, for for setting this this poem, which is entitled uh, very uh, pedestrianly. I emphasize I'm punning on pedestrianly because the title of the poem is actually an address uh, in Halifax, and a, a house, a building that still exists, and the address is 2641 Fuller Terrace. In other words, 2641 Fuller Terrace, and it's uh, if you're in Halifax, it runs off of North Street, and I'm thinking of Halifax tonight anyway because of the uh, tropical storm depression that is uh, hitting the way of the Maritimes tonight. And I'm uh, hopeful everybody will be safe and 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 make their way through the storm as easily as as possible. Uh, but 2641 Fuller Terrace is a is a place where I spent um, uh, uh, nine months uh, with a, with a, a two other guys in a flat. And, and one of the guy's names is uh, Gilbert Day. And, and Gilbert Day is a great little blues singer. I shouldn't say little, he's actually a, a, a pretty hefty guy. So uh, he's a great gravel voice blues singer, loves the blues, loves jazz, loves R&B, staying at, at Gilly Day's flat, because really it was his flat, but he had room for Timmy and me. We each had our own our own room, but I also had an extra room, which was my office as a poet, which Gilly kind of respected. We call him Gilly as a as a nickname, and and um, 
uh, and he also plays guitar. And and we had the hi-fi. He had his hi-fi set up in the main room, the living room, overlooking uh, Fuller Terrace. And the sun would be streaming in the windows of that of that uh, uh, west-facing uh, those west-facing windows in in Halifax. The afternoon, of course, west-facing. And the and the uh, hi-fi would be on, and we'd have we'd have old 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 blues. We have old classic James Brown coming out the hi-fi for crying out loud, just coming at you, boom, hitting you hard, right? And and uh, so it was a great experience. I was 27 years old. I loved it. It was it was like we had the blues. We had we had fried pepperoni, fried pepperoni out the microwave for crying out loud. Not to mention rum, old Sam. That's Gilly's rum. Old Sam rum from Barbados for crying out loud. Old Sam rum pepperoni on the table. Blues, rhythm and blues. Look at uh, uh, Gilly was 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 uh, like just an aficionado of all of that. Uh, black music, classic, mid twentieth century uh, of black music, and he had the milk curtain crates full of the old vinyl and so on. Right, so you play it anyway. That's what this poem is all about. Twenty six forty one Fuller Terrace, and commissioned by my wonderful, beautiful companion Giovanna Riccio. Gilly uplifts his gothic blues guitar to black voice, yells like rum-fired ice cracking in a full glass and stammers, jealous love, two-timing love, and bad, low-down, filthy love. His felt weight shakes his skeleton. He squints into deliberate, welcomed darkness, his fingers stroking strings tensed like fine bones he knows the steeled softness of some lovers he knows the steeled softness of some lovers he vents bob marley's poem waiting in vain practically weeping the passionate words i don't want to wait in vain for your love accompanied by eloquent guitar then the sad subtropical saxophone of john coltrane who eyes this blues genius from a black and white photograph that fronts the 31 days of january love it i've never heard you recite that george that was fast i just loved it it was fascinating <sighs> delightful uh, all right here we go <laughs> Lifts his gothic blues guitar into black voice, yowls like rum fired ice cracking in a full glass and stammers jealous love to time and love and bed low down filth and love. Lifts his gothic blues guitar His felt weight shakes his skeleton He squints into deliberate welcome darkness His fingers stroke and streams Dance like fat bones He knows Stealed softness of some lovers. Events Bob Marley's poem waiting in vain. Practically weeping the passionate words. I don't want to. Need by eloquent guitar. Oh, get it. Gilly 
really uplifts his gothic blues guitar to black voice yowls like round fired ice cracking in a full class and stammers jealous love to time and love and bed love down fill the love Lifts his gothic blues guitar His felt weight shakes his skeleton He squints into deliberate welcomes darkness His fingers stroke and strings Chants like fine bones He knows the steel softness of some lovers Then the sad subtropical saxophone of John Coltrane Who eyes this blues genius from a black and white photograph that runs The 31 days of January of January Kelly uplifts his gothic blues guitar his gothic blues guitar Kelly uplifts his gothic blues Oh my golly. Uh, yes, yes. Oh my golly. Um, we got to come down to the end. I know there's going to be uh, room for a question and answer discussion, which Gavin's going to be taking care of. But before we get to the end, I want to say once again, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dee Dee, uh, for six fabulous renditions of the poems that you've received to work with and to compose music for. I, I didn't just receive them. Thank you for commissioning them. And thank you to all these wonderful poem, uh, poet, uh, poets. That's the word, poets. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, uh, look at you, you. You've made beautiful music. And, and Giovanna, I should mention, too, for the last one, of course. Exactly. Yes, yes. You, you have you have done us wonders and miracles, marvels, uh, as usual this evening, and and uh, and I, I just want to underline a couple things before I hand the the evening, so to speak, back to Gavin. Uh, look, uh, you already mentioned the fact that you've received a Governor General's uh, grant uh, to make a yeah. CD, uh, but I want to underline uh, the beauty and the importance of that because that means that you'll be able to bring to our eardrums and to the marketplace for that matter, 16 new Canadian songs based on Canadian poems with the, with the only exception being the wonderful poetry of Yin Chao Wan from Beijing, China. And I'm so glad that Yin Chao Wan will be part of, of, uh, of, uh, our, of the CD. I almost want to say our CD. I will say it's our CD. It is, CD. it is, yes. It's your CD, but it's also our CD. Absolutely, so, absolutely. And uh, you're writing the liner notes, George. I'm writing the liner know. notes. Thank you yes. so much, sir. So that is, that is groovy. I feel like that 60s vibe is the right one right now. I also want to mention uh, quickly that we will have another Five Poets number seven, which will we think will be live at this time. And I also want to do one with Dee Dee live, maybe next year with you, Dee Dee. I might do one live, but uh, for sure, for now, I think we can say we'll have another live rendition. Mm -hmm. um, and this one will be Saturday, November 19th. The venue is still being worked out. Uh, and this time it will be featuring the music of James Rolfe, who's here in Toronto. Uh, but we're hopeful that that we'll have a live show on on November on Saturday, November nineteenth, 
And um, and I'm hopeful that you and I, Dee Dee, will do yet another uh, five poets, um, maybe early uh, 2023, and maybe it maybe one day we can we can have you here live in Toronto. Bring me back uh, to Canada, please. Yeah, Somebody we'll, we'll rescue you. Yeah. We'll rescue you with with. It's you know, crazy over here. <laughs> it's you're right. It's absolutely true. And I'm also, serious. Bring me I back. Also, back to <laughs> I also need to mention quickly that James Rolfe, uh, who's also been involved with this project, uh, has just recorded his CD last month, and that will be released sometime next year. So if I, if we are all very lucky, Dee Dee will have your CD uh, with your uh, uh, songs uh, for mainly 99% Canadian poets, and, and then uh, James with his CD of Canadian poets as well. With actually, he also has the Song of Solomon, I think, and there are a couple of psalms. So not quite Canadian, but it, it's still okay. Uh, it's still necessary uh, uh, for making good music, uh, of classical Hebrew scripture. So we'll have that as well on his CD. So it's a long way for me to say that I am so personally so pleased with the way our adventure has unfolded with you and and Dee Dee and James and Emily Hemstra, with whom I've done only one song so far, but maybe we'll do some others in the, in the future. But for me, the, uh, to, nights like tonight make the whole project so, so, so fantastically worthwhile. Uh, it sends chills down my spine. I want to hear these songs bursting onto the radio everywhere all the time. Uh, I also, before I, I shut up, finally zip my mouth, I also want to thank Gavin uh, very, very profoundly for for putting everything together tonight. And so professional, like Dee Dee, your videos with, I think, your daughter and your children. In general. Yeah, actually, this time it was my wife because I oh. had, I was still, I think I was still COVID positive when I recorded the videos. And my wife was too. Sadly, I infected her. So she was able to film me because we could go maskless. So normally my daughter would do it. I thank her for doing the first six, but my wife did the second the half, the side camera view at least. Well, it's obvious that the talent runs in the family. <laughs> uh, that might've been too much information I just gave you, but whatever. I'm no, feeling no, better it's all now. Good. We've all had it at some point, right? Come well, on. Well, hey, look, you are unmasked, uh, clearly. So That's no true, pun yeah. intended. No, I'm, I'm recovered now, so I'm, I'm good, I'm good. Maybe the pun is intended, but you are definitely yeah. unmasked. So it's all, yeah. it's all good. Uh, I'm talking too much. I'm going to shut up in a, in a moment. Okay. So I'll just say once again uh, how thrilled I am. I, I will once again thank personally uh, the poets who were who are here, who are still here uh, this evening with us, whose work has just been so phenomenal. And and that is of of course uh, Al Moritz uh, and Irving Layton, that's represented by Max Layton and Micheline Mailer. You wow, absolutely in the house. That's great. Um, and uh, Bruce Meyer uh, listening in uh, and hopefully recovering still very well from his recent uh, uh, liver operation, liver transplant, actually. Very serious operation, of course. Uh, and also, uh, I, I, I need to uh, uh, mention uh, 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 Libby Shire, and 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 uh, the rendition of her poems by Jennifer Lovegrove. And why am I thinking I'm leaving somebody out? I, I no, I'm not. Am I? Urban. You, you got it all. You got it all. Uh, okay, good. Uh, I've I've had too much of this wine. Yourself now. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, yourself. I well, yeah. yeah I and that's where okay. that's where uh, that's where I come in, I guess. And so yeah. say, oh man, what what did this guy do to us tonight? <laughs> So the whir the whirling der dervish, ladies and gentlemen, the whirling dervish of Canadian poetry, of Canadian literature, of just community in this space, George Eliot Clark, you are, sir, a marvel, a treasure, a blessing. Oh Thank my you. God. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I think we got joy beyond compare tonight. So. Uh, I, I I thank you for that, and I thank you for bringing Didi to us. Didi, your music lit the poetry up. You know, we poets can be. 
I think we feel unjustly ignored <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> yeah. But when music comes to the poetry, we feel like something is worth, <laughs> you know, everything we're doing is 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 worth uh, is worth it, you know. So uh, and and your and your music was so sensitive and so perceptive in terms of how it read the poetry out, and your singing was beautiful. Uh, George, you are tr truly, you know, your your blessing, and I thank you. Uh, you you said to me earlier today, uh, uh, you know, if we work together again, <laughs> what the words you used? You no, know, God, why would I never choose to do that? I would like so pun more punishment coming your way, my friend. Uh, we will be working together. I hope many many times. Uh, and Didi, I hope you will be also a part of that as we find ways to continue to expand this, uh, this, 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 you know, joy of 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 community that we are finding together, of yes. artists, you know, just being together and, and and making beautiful words and beautiful music and beautiful art uh, happen. Yeah. Well, thank um, you so much. I I. You know, I'm, I'm just going to make one small announcement to say that our next Tartan Turban Secret Reading is on November the 24th. It's being curated by Patrick Connors, who is a much-loved Toronto local poet. Uh, everyone knows Patrick. He shows up everywhere. He's, you know, he's the sweetest guy, and he is a generous, generous soul. Uh, so do come out to that. There'll be announcements about that. I normally read. Uh, uh, at the end of the evening, but we're very late tonight, so I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to abstain, which is a terrible, terrible uh, <laughs> word for a very simple thing. Uh, and But I thank you all for staying with us tonight, for being being our our ears, our, our hearts, uh, you know, uh, we felt lifted as on the poet side and the artist side, uh, speaking for DD here. Uh, we felt lifted by your support, and and uh, on the audience side, I, I have to say to the to the audience, as a, as a you know serious curator, buy these books, buy those CDs, support these people, push them out there. We need we need the attention. Poetry and music are hard things to make a living by, uh, you know. So uh, thank you for your support, and have a wonderful wonderful night. With all the music in my ears. Yay! Thank you all very much. We can we can stay on if anyone wants to chat, but you don't you don't have to. Uh, it's totally optional. Uh, the the I, night is I'll young. Party it. time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I need wake some up. Wine. Wine. <laughs> Wow. If anyone wants to stay and ask us any questions, whatever's whatever's left of us, <laughs> 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 we're we're here. But you know. Thank you for staying and being so patient with us. We had some tech issues at the early part of the evening. We didn't expect that. That's I, true. That worked yeah. out okay, though. That was a little worrisome, but somehow it still yeah. was possible to have a recite. So, well, um, it's about that time. So we never want to leave, right? There used to be an old Night Lives yeah, yeah. Uh, sketch, the thing that wouldn't leave, and you know, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I get some more I, chips. I, He's never going to leave me. I, 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 I've got to be the last person in the room, so I will be here. <laughs> everyone has left, and I'll shut the recording off. And uh, I do, I do want to say thank you to my my colleague uh, Bupesh Luther, who designs the posters. I I meant to incredible mention poster. That, of the that was an incredible poster. Yeah, he is an award winning designer, and we are winning award upon award as an as an agency design agency you know for every poster he designs uh globally by the way these posters get a lot of global recognition not surprising design, yeah, so. it yeah is no, they're, extraordinary. they're they are great um and and i know i know that it's late i know that that our audience has has down is down to the doubles dozen of 13 Big oh, 13. Wow. Oh, okay. Yeah. Understand. Understand. My wife, my wife is among them, though, Elizabeth. Uh, I can see right in there. So, hey. And my wife, I think, as well. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> see, they're, they're the ones well, that are going to hold on. Yeah. The, the it's so time. wonderful that they are here. But I'm just wondering, before we all do go, if anyone has any uh, questions or further reflections or conversation for any of us. Um, 
Thanks and Ben is here for my for my for my team. Thank you, Ben, for staying and helping throughout. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my absolute pleasure. I think we should do this every week. Yeah. <laughs> oh God, no. Okay, okay, Gavin, you're on. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> yeah. No, I can't think well. of a better way to spend a Friday evening. I swear, this is yeah. wonderful. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, well, thank you know. You all. We just we discovered this crazy weird uh, way of behaving uh, thanks to the uh, uh, damn pandemic. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we did the first one was in May uh, 2021, and we were surprised that well there wasn't really much else going on because there was a lot right. there was a lockdown going on. So we had a really good night. Tonight's audience was excellent, and, and we had a really good audience. Uh, in that first uh, five poets, um, and I think it was all partly because of the fact that it was such a a moment for camaraderie and a moment mm. for sharing poetry and music, which really there wasn't much any way else to access it except for whatever was already pre-recorded and available on on YouTube. So nice. yeah. Yeah, but we're still doing it. We're still doing the Zoom thing because it's actually so it's doing, helpful. Yeah. It's convenient, actually. I still yeah. deliberately teach many a lesson via Zoom because for like media scoring, at least, it's sort of the same difference, really. It's actually better in some ways. You yeah. Know, the screen and control the computer and, you know, uh, archive everything. So, and, and in this case, of course, we can all and, meet from many parts of the globe. So, yeah, we had people from Australia today, from India, Yeah. yeah. you know, so how about that i mean and yeah. of course from across the country you know across north america actually. yeah yeah so well i like so, the so idea that's, that's of, amazing yeah. i like the idea of dd being able to control everything because soon dd you're going to get a call or an email from letitia james in, mm. in the new york state uh district attorney is going to be <laughs> come in and dig up because you're right there in new york she's going to be coming to ask you to dig up some of trump's stuff yeah you know <laughs> I, I have a, a, a secret sideline gig. Yeah, I probably know enough of, and I, I've been following enough of all of that stuff. I could probably be helpful, believe it or not. Oh right. my golly! Yeah. We need much too much. You, about you all were of that. you were very helpful today, Didi, with with Max's problems. You know, yeah. I was. Well, I mean, I, I looked like, like I've never I was had that happen. That. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know how helpful that was, but I, at least, I, I don't know, the end result was he was able to still do it. So that was the bottom line. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, yeah. I have, yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious what, I'm, I'm the, the tech geek in me still wants to know, like, you know, was me the speaker, too. was it like, it's, it was just a setting in Zoom. Like, you just had to open the Zoom preferences and change the output, but I couldn't figure out how to, like, just see what the settings were. So, uh, yeah. I will stop geeking out, though. <laughs> no, you know, I'm I'm a, know. I, I was talking about the tech. Yeah. <laughs> But no, it was such a pleasure. But notwithstanding the Zoom thing, I I will also enjoy having an excuse to to finally come to Toronto. So I'll definitely. Um, I mean, the uh, the original um, game plan for the CD is such that it would it should be recorded in January. It'll be done by the summer and da 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 da. I will see if I can live up to that. I mean, I'm busy teaching, so that's probably what, what I'll still try to do. Which means I have a lot of thinking to do logistically shortly. But it also means you know maybe come the summer or, or late uh, spring, I'll, I'll have some reason anyway to come to Toronto. So anyway, hopefully, uh, I'll, well, notwithstanding my apparent adverse to Zoom, that we'll get together in person too. Yeah, yeah. we'll figure out something. You know, yeah, yeah, we'll, absolutely. We'll figure out something. So yeah. long as the let's, let's have a meal on Mavity Street. Yes. <laughs> yeah. well, I can learn how to pronounce it too, apparently. Yes. Yeah, I, I, because uh, Bruce, I, I think you may have seen Bruce sent a message uh, it in is Mavity. Yeah. about how to pronounce it properly. I'm telling you, I saw this real estate uh, ad, uh, which yeah. all it really means is that they got it wrong, I'm sure, because you guys <laughs> know. But I just thought, well, that clearly is how it's pronounced it, 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 because it's the street in Toronto. Yeah. And it's like, if you want to visit 993 Mav Mavidi Street, and I was like, oh, I guess that's how it's pronounced. And I guess I should have asked the actual composer of the poem. But I'll, I'll change it, obviously, <laughs> for, the, uh, for the recorded version quite easily. Um, so that's not a And I will, send you, I will send you this recording uh, for sure, Didi. Yes, so you yes. Can, you can slip in the, the, the good res. Yeah, every time... Yeah. It, uh, yeah, and maybe I'll even insert the corrected. Uh, no, okay, I'll, I'll I'll do the. <laughs> like, Mavity, like every time I, I sing that word. All right, I'm getting apparently uh, loopy, so I better go. <laughs> okay, uh, as we, uh, Gavin, one last thing: Will you be able also to record the chat messages? Because a lot of them are they're very nice. I, 
I believe the chat is automatically recorded. Uh, Not when, sure when about you... that, but you can you can copy yeah. and paste it at least, or save it as a. Uh, you know what? I will do that right now. Yeah, like you that can just literally good. just select all and paste it just to have it, and then um, I, the yeah. problem is I I don't know if save it'll chat. replay it in real time. There we anything. go. Chat saved. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for saying that, Didi. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's been a while since I because we don't usually use Zoom. We use Google Meet. But because mm. there was music today, we we you know I, I I thought we should do Zoom because it's better for music. It is better. Yeah. I mean, it is nice that you can share in stereo, which is is pretty amazing. I mean, it took a, about a year for that to be clearly doable. Yeah. You know, so the first year when we pivoted to online, it was not, I don't want to say nightmarish, but it was frustrating to say the least. Uh, and then when it became stereo, it was like, oh, wow, this is great. You know, you know, you can really everything, enjoy it. Everything you two just said, if I put it together, you got an ad for Zoom. Thank you very much. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, may the pandemic never end. No, okay. Uh, that's, that's crazy. But it is more convenient that time. Yeah, I don't want to. Yeah, I see a, a, a mini me character going, mm, yes, pandemic. <laughs> Zoom. Zoom thing going. Zoom. So, um, well, uh, I better take off. I'll, I'll have, the next time I'm in town, I'll have a drink with everybody at this moment. But for now, I will go back. All right, time. man. Thank you, Dee Dee. Thank, Thank you, right. Kevin. Thank, Thank you, you again so much. Thank Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Jordan. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Joe, Catherine, Valerie. Yes, you all. Good night. Thanks so much. And, and, Thank okay, you. Thank you. I'll, I'll see you. everybody. Okay. See you soon. God bless. Right. Take care. Bless. Ben, thank you so much. Oh, not at all, Gavin. <laughs> I, I guess you're not the only one. There's still three more who... Yeah, there might be just... Who may have forgotten. On mute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're going off to have dinner, maybe you know that that does happen every now and then. But so, thank you all if you, if you're still listening for yeah. staying on. And ben, yes, take care. All right, let me just see. Yeah, take care, man. Thank you very much. Much appreciated all the help today. Not at all. Take care.